and God is greater than all our fears. We're going to look at that subject in just a moment as we conclude this series on damaged human emotions. You're here, how we get stuck in our minds with our emotions um, on anxiety and fear today. But just a couple quick things I want to mention. One is, as I deal with today's message, I recognize, and I want everyone to know this, that there are some people who have physiological chemical imbalances that need some real therapeutic help with that imbalance. Okay, that's for some, but the vast majority who deal with fear and anxiety don't have that as an issue, and that's what I want to address today, this whole idea we don't need to fear because God has promised through Jesus uh, to be with us. Also, next week, I begin a new series as we hang out in the book of Luke for the next months on how to handle difficult people in our lives. D -d Does anybody know what that's like? <laughs> Would the rest of you quit lying? Uh, we all have difficult people in our lives. We're going to look at Luke, the sixth chapter, and some of Jesus' teachings on that. And, and before we give uh, the message, let me also cover this one thing that, that a friend asked me just to, to pass on to you. Anybody who might have an answer to this, uh, a friend of mine has two tickets for the Super Bowl in Minneapolis uh, on Sunday night, U.S. Bank Stadium, February 4th. Uh, they're box seats, and he paid $3,500 per ticket, which includes the bus to and from the airport, lunch, dinner, a $400 bus tab and a pass to the winner's locker room after the game. Um, but what my friend didn't realize that when he bought the tickets last year was that it's on the same day as his wedding. <laughs> so he just wanted me to ask, if any of you are interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at St. Paul's Church at 3 p.m. Her name is Ashley. She's five feet, four inches tall, 115 pounds, a good cook, loves to fish, and will hunt and clean your truck. She'll be the one in the white dress. You can't miss her. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure you knew about Ashley at the wedding. Okay. Anxiety and fear. Does anybody struggle with it? I mean, we, we all do at some level or another. And Jesus gives us some answers in our text today. Before I read them, just realize again, as you look at the biblical narrative, I've tried so hard through the years to teach you folks to have a biblical worldview. If you can develop one, it will address so many of your questions and so many of your issues. Genesis 1 and 2, God created the world perfectly. Everything operated well. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. They were in a perfect relationship with him. He was always there for them. They never had to worry about anything. Genesis 3 happened with the fall, the serpent, the evil one. The enemy came and shattered everything as Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And do you know what was the first negative human emotion because of the fall? Fear. Fear. Fear was never a part of God's original intent. He was with Adam and Eve. He walked closely with them. He met their every need. But because of the fall, fear came into the world. So today we're going to look at anxiety, which leads to fear. Now, another place we get stuck in our emotions where Jesus can't thrive in us. So out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, if you're able now, would you please stand with me? Luke 4.18 has been the standard verse through all of this series. Uh, so interesting, Jesus took this scroll in the temple called Capernaum, and from it he read Isaiah 61, his first sermon ever, and these words came from his lips, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Remember, there's one God and three persons for Christians, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is upon Jesus because he, the Holy Spirit, has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. The gospel of grace is for people who are poor in spirit, who realize they need a Savior. He, who is he here? The Father, God the Father, has sent me, the Son, uh, with the Holy Spirit upon him to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are what, folks? Oppressed. Jesus wants to set you free from your damaged emotions. He wants you to get free. And then today's text is from Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 22 through 34, the word of the Lord. And Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. That's the first time it's mentioned. Don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, nor what you put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. 
Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Of how much more value are you than the birds? And of you by being anxious. Second time Jesus mentions anxiety. By being anxious, can you add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If you don't know, Solomon's a character in the Bible who was the richest guy ever and had incredible clothing. And yet the lilies of the field were more splendorous in their clothing than he. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little, what folks? Little faith. Jesus did condemn people who had little faith. He doesn't want you to live in little faith. He wants you to live in great faith. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock. Don't you love that term of endearment, little flock? The shepherd speaking to his sheep. Don't fear, little sheep. (laughs) For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your what? Will your heart be also. For the heart of the matter, folks, is a matter of the heart. It's all about the heart. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Father, use this time now to help your people grow in their faith, to rid themselves of anxiety and worry and fear, to be set free captives no more. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. So think about all the things you're anxious and fearful about. I made a list, and it's certainly not all inclusive, but I know this is what I hear regularly as a pastor and a friend, aging, death, People are anxious and fearful about loneliness. Did you know the United Kingdom has just made a cabinet position called the Minister of Loneliness? No kidding. A government position called the Minister of Loneliness. Why? Because so many people are aging without families. So it's a phenomenon in America that's commonly being called kinlessness. Since people aren't getting married or delaying marriage, delaying children or not having children at all, there's a phenomenon in America called kinlessness right now. People don't have kin. They don't have relatives. They don't have people who will look after them, and it's causing anxiety and fear. Being accepted or being rejected, being abused, having enough money, to make it for the rest of your life. The fear of failure, the fear of the future, fear of disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, which are increasing in number, by the way, which the Bible said was going to happen before the second coming of Jesus. They're going to become more regular and more intense, signaling that he's coming back to restore creation to Genesis 1 and 2, like God originally created. Thermonuclear war. We've got people threatening it all over the place. Something bad's going to happen to my family, my loved ones. I'm going to lose my job. ISIS. It was interesting. A couple of years ago, Marilyn and I went to Lebanon to visit the Syrian refugee camps where your dollars are going to help the Syrian refugee crisis in profound ways. And before we left, we had people take us aside and go, Don't go, don't go. You're going to confront ISIS. And, and, you know, we may have, we're right there on the Syrian border, but what was so funny is the people there in Lebanon who daily experienced the dangers of ISIS, they had no fear because they just said God will protect us. 
But people here fear ISIS. People there right next to ISIS don't fear ISIS, those who walk closely with the Lord. Sickness, illness, cancer, other diseases. And the most amazing thing about this list that I just comprised, which again isn't all inclusive, is 90 plus percent of these things will never happen. And yet still we have anxiety and fear about them, don't we? So what are the definitions of anxiety and fear? Let me give you what I think they are. Anxiety is a belief something bad may happen. Fear is the belief something bad will happen. Anxiety is like a low-grade fever. You know, you've got it, but you can still function. Fear is a 103-degree temperature. It flattens you. And, And here's the truth. Anxiety usually comes before fear. And if you don't deal with your anxiety, that nagging low-grade temperature, that sense of foreboding about something bad may happen, it will eventually turn into fear. If you don't deal with the anxiety, it will eventually turn to fear. And it's interesting in this text, Jesus mentions anxiety and worry five times. He mentions fear only once. But in each of them, he says, don't be anxious, don't fret, don't be afraid. So it's not a part of what God wants our human condition to be. So so as you look at the problem and you see what it does to our lives and our insides, it causes us to be unproductive. It saps strength and energy from us. None of us are supposed to live in anxiety and fear. What's the answer? I think Jesus makes it clear. And at the risk of being terribly simple, it's this. The answer to anxiety and fear is faith. (laughs) It's faith. Jesus said to the people that he was addressing, oh, you have little faith. (laughs) Now, Now, faith has several different definitions in the Bible. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. Let me just give you the simplest definition of faith I can give you. You're a child and you're totally dependent on your parents. For everything. You can't work. You can't provide. You're dependent upon a loving daddy. Let's just go there. A loving father who has promised to take care of every need that you have. He's a loving daddy who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And if you'll just trust me, if you'll believe that I'll do this, all your anxiety and all of your fears will melt away. That's what Jesus is saying here. And and as he takes us through this text, we're going to see how he tells us more specifically to deal with anxiety and fear. But before we go there, let me just take this whole idea of being a child dependent upon the Father in a more profound way. Because, folks, this is essential. For those of us who follow Jesus, we've got something the world doesn't have. And Jesus said so. When you keep questing after things like food and and fashion, it's futile. That's the way the world lives. It just quests after these things and never has enough. And that's part of the reason for the anxiety and fear. But but you're different, Jesus said. And, And what a child of God knows is, first of all, that we're terrible sinners that we've just messed up. We're Adam and Eve in our generation. We've shaken our fist at God and said, I'm going to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to define what's good and evil. I don't want God, you to be Lord over my life. I'm going to be Lord over my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. We listen to the voice of the tempter who said, did God really say that? And we go, no, God really didn't say that. And we have eaten of the fruit Just like Adam and Eve did, we have rebelled against God. We've created high treason against God. We deserve the gallows. We deserve what every traitor in a country deserves, and that's the capital punishment of death. We all deserve that. And if you don't start with that idea that you are a reprobate sinner and you're in need of a Savior, you'll never understand what it means to depend upon a good, loving daddy. It all begins there, folks. You love Jesus in direct proportion to how great a sinner you think you are. Now, I could go through the Ten Commandments and show you how that's God's moral law and how each one of us fall far short of it, especially number 10. 
You think you do all the others pretty well, then you get to number 10, thou shalt not, anybody know what it is? Covet. And we're all guilty. We, we all compare ourselves to other people and want what they have. We're just guilty, guilty, guilty. And we've committed high treason against God. We deserve the penalty of death. But God so loved this world. He sent Jesus, the second person of the Godhead here, to us. And he died on the cross and took the penalty of capital punishment upon himself so that we wouldn't have to. And then he gives us the free gift of our freedom in him by grace through faith. It's the most marvelous gift possible. I don't know why anybody would turn it down. It astounds me why anybody doesn't want to follow Jesus. Because in that freedom of knowing my sins are forgiven, not only am I declared not guilty, but then the resurrection power of Jesus that happened three days after the cross enters my heart, and now God lives in me. God is with me. God is for me. God goes before me. Interestingly, in the Bible, every time it says, fear not, it follows with, fear not for I am, anybody know? With you. Over and over and over again. Don't be afraid for I am with you. God's antidote to fear is the powerful resurrection life of Jesus in us. He goes before us. There's nothing we'll face in the future that he hasn't already met for us. I remember after I played three years in the European professional leagues, I came back to America not knowing what in the world I was supposed to do with my life. And so I naturally called Coach Smith, my college coach, and said, Coach, do you have anything you can do to help me as I'm trying to think through the next stage of my life? Not sure what it is. He said, no, I really don't have any answers, Dave. But, you know, John Lotz, who was the assistant coach who was here, is now the head coach at the University of Florida. Why don't you give him a call? And see if there's anything available there. Well, I did. And John's a dear friend, was a mentor to me in my relationship with the Lord. I said, John, do you have anything at all at the University of Florida? And he said, you know, David, I just don't. I just promised our graduate assistant internship to somebody. That had been perfect for you, but I've already promised it. So sorry. If anything comes up, I'll give you a call. I said, well, thank you. The next day, the phone rings, and it's Coach Lotz. And he says, David, he said, you're not going to believe this. But the guy to whom I just promised the graduate assistantship just came into my office and said he doesn't want it. Do you want it? And I said, I think I do. He said, well, get in the car and drive up. And I said, when? He said, right now. So I got in the car and drove up to Gainesville, Florida, met with Coach Lotz. We're sitting there. He said, now, if you're going to be a graduate assistant, you've got to be able to be a graduate student. So do you have some field of study you'd like to choose to study? And I went, oh, man, I, I don't know. And, and John's sitting there going, Dave, you've got to find something. He said, it's July and classes begin in August and you know most graduate programs around here are already full now is there anything that comes to mind and I just blurted out you know coach I've always loved helping people maybe I could do something in a graduate school of psychology and counseling and he went hmm that's interesting he said the head of the counseling graduate program is also president of the Gainesville tip-off club and my closest friend do, 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 do. anyway Dr. Joe Whitmer comes into the office that afternoon and sits there and says, we know it's July and um, we don't have all of your transcripts in and I don't know if I can get you in. We're already full. And then he looked at me with kind of a wink and a nod and he said, but you know, again, I am the chairman of the program and I can probably do whatever I want to do. <laughs> so bottom line is I spent two and a half years in Gainesville earning three quarters of a degree, earning a doctorate almost in counseling and psychology. And here's what the point being. When I came back from Europe, I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do. I had a choice. I could either fall into despair, anxiety, and fear, or I could say, God, you live in me through Jesus. You go before me, and you've already planned the next stage of my life. Which is the better choice? To walk as a child in faith. And, and what's so interesting to me is my undergraduate at the University of North Carolina, I had a communications degree. In my graduate school at Florida, I had a counseling degree. In my undergraduate, I learned how to talk. In my graduate program, I learned how to listen. And at the end of it all, what did God do? Have I got a plan for you, you know? He called me into ministry, and what do you have to do in ministry? You have to talk, and you have to listen. God went before me, and he goes before you, folks. But he wants you to totally and completely trust him. The antidote to anxiety and fear is faith. To trust him like a child. 
in every single area of your life. And when you do, he leads. And you have it off your shoulders because they're on his. And here's what you need to know too. That when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, he ascended into heaven. And Colossians 2.15 says that when Jesus ascended to heaven, a victory parade happened there. And the devil was made a mockery of in the center streets of heaven. In Roman times, whenever the Romans conquered a nation, they would take the king of that nation and put him into a cage and display him in the streets of Rome. And all the people were going, yeah. that's what God did to the evil one. He defeated him on that cross. He has no power over you if you are a child of God in Jesus Christ. You're not fighting him every day. You are trusting in the one who's already fought him and defeated him. You're not fighting for victory against the devil. You're fighting from victory. He's already been defeated. Now, if that's the case, you walk in faith confidently with that swagger. Last week, Marilyn and I were in Chapel Hill, and they celebrated the 1967, 68, and 69, three straight in a row, ACC and Final Four champion teams. Never happened in the history of the ACC. I was on the 69 team. And we went out on center court during halftime of the game. And then in the second half, we were in the stands. And for those of you, are, are there any Wolfpack fans here? <laughs> Father, please be with them. They know not what they do. Um, <laughs> you started coming back, and you started beating my Tar Heels. And Marilyn leaned over to me. She said, what's going on? What's happening? And the only thing I could think of is they've lost their swagger. They, they think they're going to lose. They'd lost the game before. They, they thought they were going to lose. As soon as the comeback happened, they thought they were going to lose. And the more they thought they were going to lose, guess what happened? They lost. Folks, the more you think the devil's going to win, the more you're going to lose. But the more you have faith that he's already been defeated and you're fighting from a place of victory, not for victory. He knows it and he has no power over you. He smells anxiety and fear in your heart. He sees you losing your swagger and he starts to put the full court press upon you to beat you. Because he doesn't care how he does it. He just wants to render you impotent. And the way you beat him is with the swagger. Colossians 2.15, you were made a spectacle of in heaven in a cage defeated by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives in me and goes before me. Do you believe that today? If you do, would you give God an ovation as loudly as you possibly can? It's faith. It's believing. That's true. Now, Jesus gives more specific ways to conquer anxiety and fear in the text I just read you. Let me go over them. There are four. First of all, he says, consider creation. Now, now note that he says consider. That, that has to do with the mind. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Consider creation. And what he invites all of us to do who are prone to have anxiety or fear is focus your minds, first of all, upon ravens. Now, now, why ravens? Well, first of all, for a faithful Jew, they're unclean birds. And if you touched a raven, you had to go into an unclean protocol to get clean again. And ravens are nasty, aren't they? They are caulking, croaking, carrying birds. They eat other prey. They're not attractive. And I think purposely Jesus said, consider the raven. In Psalm 147, by the way, the psalmist says, God even hears the cries of ravens and answers their needs. God even hears the cries of these awful carrion birds and meets their needs. And Jesus says, if God meets the needs of these unclean birds, he gives an argument 
which is from a philosophical standpoint called the argument from the lesser to the greater. So he says, if God cares for ravens and meets all of their needs, these three words, how much more? Say it to me. How much more does he care for you, the crown of his creation? Then secondly, he says, consider not only the ravens, consider the lilies of the field. (laughs) When you look at them and you see how splendorously they're clothed, it embarrasses Solomon, the best dressed guy in the history of the world. And if God cares that much for lilies, flowers, who live one day and die the next and then are gathered up and thrown into an oven, if God meets the splendorous needs of lilies, he asks the question from the lesser to the greater. Three words. What are those three words? How much more does he care for you? The crown of his creation. So, folks, if ever you start to have worry or fear, go to the mountains, go to the beach, go someplace beautiful and just contemplate creation and let your faith increase. And then he also secondly says, contemplate God's character. You've got to get this one down. Jesus calls the father here a good father, a loving father. And if you don't believe God is good, your faith's never going to grow. Never. It'll it'll always be a tiny faith. And and for me, I've had some awful things happen in my life. You know, I was almost killed at gunpoint in a robbery. I've had some terrible things happen in my life. But through them all, I have chosen to say, but you're a good father, and you're working everything for good, and I trust you. And that's been the healing place in my heart when bad things happen to me. I don't know how you're doing it, Lord, but you're working this bad thing for good because you're good. Remember Gentry and Hadley Eddings? When they lost their two boys in that tragic automobile accident, I never heard them gripe one time. Meryl and I went out to dinner with them several times. We kept waiting for them to complain. Never one time did they complain. And they kept saying over and over again, God is good, and God's going to use this for good because God is good. And they said this too, it's not over till it's good because God is good. They had to wait two years, but you know the story. God gave them identical twins. Don't have any history of it in their families at all. But God did that because God is what, folks? God's good. You've got to know the character of God. He's a good father. He's a good, loving father. Thirdly, capture your thoughts. Jesus said twice, consider the ravens, consider the lilies. You've got to capture your thoughts. 1 Corinthians 10 says, take every thought captive. You cannot let... Thoughts of unbelief, anxiety, fear, shame, all the stuff we've been covering this month into your mind. You've got to literally take a a spear and usher that thought out of your life. Say, no, you can't come in here. And I'm going to be very blunt with you right now. I'm going to talk to you like I have my kids. i got three grown kids. They all love Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. But I had to talk bluntly with them, as did their mom. And we said to them more than once this truth. If you watch stuff on your computer and television that is dark, ugly, godless, of death, lusty, sexual, I don't care how many shades of gray it has, if you put that stuff into your mind, your faith will be shattered. If you're putting that junk in your mind, folks, your faith is diminishing And you're inviting anxiety and fear to increase every day. And now we have through Netflix and Amazon and other channels the ability to binge on godlessness, binge on darkness, binge on death. I don't know about you, but my God is a God of life. He's a God of light. He's a God of love. And he has nothing to do with that dark junk. Why are you putting it in your minds? No wonder Christians are so anxious. They binge watch garbage. Don't do it. Please. Take captive every thought. Every thought. If something comes on TV that has godlessness on it, you flip the channel, turn it off, and start singing a song to Jesus. Please. Am I passionate enough about that? 
because I've seen too many counseling sessions where I get to the, what are you watching? And I get all the garbage they've been watching. And I go, no wonder you're feeling these feelings. And finally, claim an eternal perspective. Claim an eternal perspective. Did, did you hear Jesus you know, say, you know, seek first the kingdom. You know, sell your possessions and give to the needy and provide for yourselves money bags that do not grow old. Why are we putting so much energy into things and, and guarding them and being worried about somebody coming and stealing stuff that we're not going to have any part of in heaven? I can't speak for you, but I'm an eternal creature. I'm a soul who has a body, not a body that has a soul. So many people are caring for their bodies instead of their souls. My soul is my eternity, and I have a body that's aging every day. Yours is too. And one day it's going to die. You may not believe that, young folks. You think you're bulletproof. It will, I promise you. And what's going to be left is your soul. How are you caring for your soul? And you're spending so much time with your soul taking material possessions and trying to take care of them where moths can eat them, thieves can steal them, rust can erode them, and they're not having any eternal value. You're not going to be able to take them to heaven with you. There's been no U-Haul ever attached to a hearse. I've never seen it once. Never. Never. Can, can I show you a picture last week at the UNC North Carolina State game? It was, it was a couple pictures of me with the guys out there on the court. I'm right there, the tall guy in the red shirt, Slee Deadman. He's a dear old friend of mine. He's 6'11". I'm 6'7 and a half or so. Let me just tell you something. He's tall. I'm normal. You're short. Okay? You just got that? <laughs> I had my three seconds of fame. They called out my name. I stepped out, waved, and got a little... In fact, there were some Forest Hillers there who applauded real loudly. God bless both of you. Anyway, um, <laughs> and, and what hit me in that was the only reason I'm out there is because Coach Smith, by his grace, offered me a scholarship. I, to this day, I wonder why he did. But he gave me a scholarship, by his grace. And so, therefore, I got a round of applause. If you believe in Jesus, not by your merit, but only because of his grace, you're on his team. And when you get to heaven, there's going to be a huge ovation of thousands upon thousands applauding you into heaven. But here's the question, whose team are you on? It's either one or the other. You're on Satan's team or you're on Jesus' team. If you're neutral, you're on Satan's team. Jesus' team is working to advance the kingdom of God. The others are trying to live for this moment. My dear wife, Marilyn, came to believe in Jesus when she finally realized that she was on Satan's team, serving him in her pride. That's what drove her in her sinfulness to the cross where she accepted Jesus and lives in his strength and power. Folks, which team are you on? If you've not made that decision, make that decision because when you die, your soul is all that's left and it'll appear before God either forgiven or unforgiven. Which team are you on? I beg you to be on team Jesus. I beg you and start working for the kingdom of God. And then you'll start using your money. That's why I ask you to tithe 10%. Why? You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. You can send it ahead. And there'll be people who meet Jesus because of the ministry of Forest Hill and your money here. They'll be there greeting you in heaven. The needy, the poor. I was at a conference on Saturday afternoon of all 200 churches in the city trying to figure out how to come together to solve the poverty problem in Charlotte. Folks, Forest Hill's fingerprint is all over this city in caring for the poor all over the city and if you give your money here when you get to heaven those poor people who love jesus are going to thank you for sending it ahead but don't lay it up here will you just leave it for your kids to spend in ways you don't want it to be spent are you crazy what are you doing? Some of you are sitting on millions upon millions of dollars. And you're going to pass it on to your kids, and they're going to use it in godless ways. Put it to work now. Put it to work now. Send it ahead. Because the kingdom of God needs our resources to advance his kingdom. My final point, again, is just train your brain. Tra train your brain with faith. And when you start to look at this world and feel anxious or fearful, you spear that thought 
and you accompany it out of your mind, you say, no, I choose to believe in Jesus because he's the one in John 14, one who said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't you allow it. Don't let your hearts be troubled. But believe in God. Believe in the Father. Believe also in me, the Son. And when you do, you will be set free.